So our next guests are two internet pioneers, in fact, early, early entrepreneurs and investors who've been around, knew this space even before crypto came along, but they saw the vision very early when it came to crypto. Um, and so I want to welcome to the stage Glenn Hutchins, who is the CEO and founder of uh, um, North Island Ventures, uh, Jeremy Allaire, who is the CEO of Circle, and they'll be introduced by Christine Lee, who is our moderator today, and she's a Coindesk TV anchor. So Christine, let's uh, bring out Glenn and uh, Jeremy and, and dive into a rich discussion about what happens when money actually goes digital. Good morning, Austin. Good morning, Consensus. Thanks. Woo! Thank you for the energy. Thank you for that introduction, Michael. We've got a wonderful panel before us. We've got Jeremy Lair. He is the CEO and founder of Circle, the second largest builder of the second largest CB, uh, stable coin, USDC, an early entre internet entrepreneur as well, an OG in the space. And we've got Glenn Hutchins, who is also a OG in crypto, but also even way back further. He was into fintech before fintech was cool. He served <laughs> <laughs> nine years on the New York Federal Reserve. He is a prolific investor in financial services, and he joins us as well. And so I guess the first question we want to ask, you know, when are we going to make crypto as easy as sending email? Crypto payments as easy as sending an email. And when you first set out your vision in 2013 and starting Circle, I mean, did you see it to where we are today? Or, you know, what do you see that is wanting? Yeah, I mean, that concept was the, you know, one of the founding principles behind Circle when we started the company in 2013. And we really thought that um, eventually, uh, and it wasn't possible in 2013, but eventually you could have a, a protocol for dollars on the internet. Uh, you know, we have the web protocols, we have the email protocols, they let us exchange information and data and content and communications instantly, globally, for free. We thought there ought to be, uh, you know, what I called an HTTP of money, like the web protocol, but like a, a protocol for money. And, and in our mind, it was, you know, the, the idea of taking what we think of as traditional money, like government debt money, liabilities of a central bank money, and expressing that as a cryptocurrency and then making it work on these networks. And the idea was that if you could do that, that you know, effectively over time, it would be kind of like the, the, the physics of the internet, it would drive the cost towards zero, and you would have the same kind of open, interoperable, frictionless way to move value that you have with information. And so that was the idea. And in terms of seeing it, yeah, we, we saw that becoming possible, and, and now I think we're really close uh, I mean, it is actually here today, meaning you can, you can use dollars on the internet in this way with things like USDC, and, um, you know, and that's growing fast, and we're getting really close to the cost, getting close to zero, and we're getting really close to like major consumer applications kind of connecting this up to make it something that just everyone uses every day. Certainly the rise of stable coins, particularly USDC, has brought us closer to there, but what do you see as the obstacles that still lie in the way? Yeah, I, I, I'm you know a technologist first, so I first think about the technology problems that have to be solved, and I um, I like to refer to kind of where we are in, in blockchain as sort of we're in that dial-up to broadband phase, uh, you know where you know remember the dial-up internet and you could only do certain amount, certain capacity, and then people built out the new capacity and you had broadband, and then all of a sudden you could do all these things that you were originally promised you could do. Third generation blockchains, which are really a very competitive market, these layer one blockchains are coming online. We've launched USDC on nine blockchain protocols. We're gonna launch it on more. And, and now those are kind of like the broadband coming online. So one is just having scalable, low cost global infrastructure that makes that possible. So that's one problem. Another problem is just what I call the user experience problem, which is that for the average person, cutting and pasting a public key address, uh, the risk of fat fingering that, knowing what this stuff is, not gonna work. Yeah. And so we have, to, we have to solve the UX problem. And that's 
the good news is that's a much easier problem to solve than like scalable layer one infrastructure. And so there's a lot of great companies working on that. And there are great traditional companies like the Squares of the World and others that are sort of wiring up to crypto. And so we're going to get incredible user experiences that, that work as seamlessly as, as anything else like an NFC payment or QR codes and things like that. So we're going to get that very soon. How are you going to get the fees down? Well, I mean, fundamentally, if you have an on-chain dollar and, the, and the, the transaction cost is the cost of the blockchain transaction itself, you're now, you know, on third generation blockchains, transaction fees are, you know, from a, a 20th of a penny to a few cents. And so it's down. It's, that's today. And so, and that will only continue to improve as the build out, that kind of capacity build out um, happens. So I think we've, we've already gotten there. It's wiring up the user experience. And then final piece, and I'm sure we'll come back to it, is we have to have um, well-defined national level um, statutes around stable coins because households and firms and financial institutions are not going to adopt this at scale until they know what the heck these things are and that they're something that they can put on their balance sheet and, and understand and use. And so we're really close to that as well. And so as those things happen, then I think we can get to a billion users. Have you had a chance to look at Senator Gillibrand and Alumis's legislation and perhaps your thoughts on some of the provisions that they wrote about stable coins? Do you agree? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I, I think there's a lot of very good proposals there. I think there are many good proposals. There's, they have good proposals. Senator Toomey has good proposals. Uh, you know, there are proposals from the Democrats and Republicans. This is a bipartisan issue, and you're seeing bipartisanship around it. So that's very encouraging. You don't see that a lot in Washington. You're seeing it in this topic because everyone understands you need to have a good set of policy on stable coins. They want more disclosures. They want you to be able to redeem at par. Yeah, so it's the good news is the way we launched USDC from day one was as a regulated dollar digital currency that has uh, you know, supervision by banking regulators, that has uh, you know, statutory consumer protection requirements, all these things. You want to codify that at a national level, and you want to make sure everybody follows those rules uh, so that there's you know, no, kind of not, not uh, a gap in the system that could introduce you know, the, the financial stability risk and other risks that people are concerned about. Let's bring Glenn into the conversation. So you have mastered financial services throughout the year. So when looking at the crypto industry, what do you see in terms of what interests you in, in, in cryptocurrencies and how will it penetrate the incumbents that are currently existing in the financial services world? Okay, thank you. So full disclosure, I'm an investment in, I have an investment in Jeremy's con con company, so everything he says is right. <laughs> Uh, and, I, I, and I want him to be enormously successful. Thank you. He's also on the board of Digital Currency Group, yeah. which is the parent company of Coindesk. Full disclosure, I'm also <laughs> on the board of the parent company for this organization. Maybe that's why they got me here. You know, who knows? Um, but, so I, my interest has moved beyond payments. I came into um, uh, the crypto world from the fintech world seeking to disrupt the payments industry, which had not been disrupted yet. You know, the, credit card industry, remittances, foreign exchange, that kind of thing, which had been immune to disruption. Uh, and that was hence one of my first investments was in Circle, because I thought he, Jeremy was on that path. Uh, my interest has evolved. Uh, I think er everything Jeremy just said is right, so this is not meant to contradict him. But I've discovered that in the Bitcoin world, I've concluded in the Bitcoin world, because of the design of the technology, particularly around the mining, that it's too expensive and too slow to really be a payments modality at scale. A lot of, uh, but though Jeremy's, um, the stable coin piece of this is a really important piece to get there. But my mind has gone to um, marketplaces that are driven by proof of stake that are cheaper. Uh, and um, then, by the way, having invested in new technologies over the course of my career, what happens next is not a direct replica of what happened before that. What you do is you obsolete the prior economy by reconceptualizing it. Totally. Right? And so the reconceptualization here is it's not about something that looks like credit card payments or remittances, in my view. Exactly. Inside these non-fungible networks like Flow, you have payments that happen inside those networks as a consequence of what people are doing inside that network. So people go into the Flow environment to buy and sell NBA Top Shot trading cards. And they compensate each other inside that environment 
to engage in that form of commerce. And then when they exit from that environment, they then take the flow tokens and turn them into USDC and then enter the rest of the economy. So that's how I think about it now. It's not something that looks just like credit cards. The way to think about cryptocurrencies in my mind is not as a new form of money, but as a new type of commerce, a new paradigm of computing, and a new form of corporate organization. And if you think about it from that perspective, the possibilities are endless. And so my interest in finance is something that looks more like decentralized finance today. Individual marketplaces are communities that can engage in type, financial types of transactions based upon smart contracts, uh, not purely payments. Does that make sense? Yeah, how will traditional financial services survive in that new paradigm? Will they have to innovate to survive or get so, you know, left behind? There's a huge issue out there associated with their regulatory barriers to entry that they have as large enterprises, and they will use the regulatory barriers to entry to keep themselves um, protected by that moat they can build around them. But I would just say, as technology evolves, you know, m IBM didn't become Microsoft. Microsoft didn't become Google. Google didn't become Facebook. Facebook didn't become Amazon, and Amazon's not going to become Circle or Coinbase. The world evolves, and the legacy competitors typically get defined away because the activity is new. So will the uh, large financial institutions that now collect massive rents as a result of being uh, centralized hierarchies uh, in, a, in a world in which they can extract rents from doing that continue for some time period? Yes. Will, will they be particularly protected by the areas that are most regulated? Deposit taking and lending? Probably. Will a lot of the stuff around them that they do be taken away by new modes of, com of commerce? that render what they do irrelevant rather than replace it? Absolutely. I, I think, like, you can take analogies from other internet industry transformations, right? Like, the media industry, like, built new direct-to-consumer models, built new consumption models, disrupted the unit economics of content distribution, all these things. Media companies still exist. A lot right. of them had to restructure their business models. Yeah. A lot of them did not make that transition and completely new major platforms were built. Yeah, the broadcast companies didn't build Netflix. Right. Netflix was right. brand new. And AT&T did not build WhatsApp. And, and so, you know, communications is just a free software service. It's not something you pay for anymore. That's just the new world. The new paradigm. And so I think, so I very much share Glenn's view right. on this vis-a-vis -vis financial service utility will shift to these decentralized infrastructures. So I'm curious, Glenn, what are you investing in? What am I investing in? Yeah. I'm not being paid for this. <laughs> no, but I'm interested in right now um, three or four categories. Decentralized finance, uh, what's now called the metaverse, which is basically digital property. Yeah, uh, um, like digital real estate. Uh, permissionless development and digital real estate, all types of stuff inside the metaverse. Um, uh, identity management and uh, personal data uh, and uh, infrastructure associated with Web 3.0. Uh, and governance associated with kind of DAOs. Those are the five kind of categories where I'm looking at as an investor right now. And he's also an investor in the Celtics. I am, so you yes. You have a nice ring there on your Game, game your four hand. tonight. Come root for us. <laughs> I also wanted to bring the my, conversation. My man Jerry up there. <laughs> Big Celtics fan, front row. I want to bring the conversation around to uh, the collapse of Terra Luna, a very uh, prolific algorithmic stable coin. And during that market collapse, Terra Luna was, and USD, had a market cap together of about $60 billion. When that collapsed, we saw something very interesting happen to stablecoins. Tether, which had a market cap of about $83 billion, went down to $73 billion. And USDC went from $48 billion to $53 billion. 54. 54. <laughs> so I guess the question on the tip of everyone's tongue is, will there be a flippening? Well, you know. Um, USDC has been growing really quickly for the last couple of years and taking market share. And I think as this gets used, as this technology gets used in more and more applications and more and more businesses and financial institutions and others use it, they're going to want well-regulated dollar digital currency models like this. And I think when you think about the size of the addressable market, M2 money, uh, it's a big total addressable market. And so the numbers that we're looking at today, 54 billion, 72 billion, are really small. Right, the, the, the opportunity space here is ultimately in the trillions of dollars in circulation. 
And that's when this connects in the real world economy. That's when this is connected to commerce and trade and is built into more of the financial system. And that's what we're focused on. We've always been focused on trying to build something for that evolution in the market. And so that's always going to be larger than something that's opaque and offshore and unregulated and has had regulatory challenges and other things. It's just always that there's that's capped in what it can be. There is a market for offshore, uh, you know, dollar shadow banking. Uh, there's, there's a, uh, you know, there are people who need that product, um, but I don't think that's what we're building. And I think that the mainstream phase of this is just dramatically larger. So that, that's the long-winded answer. The short-winded answer is yes, we absolutely will see this uh, flip. But I'm, fo I'm not focused on that per se. I'm focused on how do we build more use cases, more utility, uh, make this easier for people, you know, firms. How do we build the next generation of on-chain infrastructure for capital markets and lending and other things that are going to really bring this to life? And, um, and, and you know, that's really the focus. Um, and I think, you know, per your comments about the, the market moves, right, there has been a flight to quality. Uh, and, and we've seen not just the numbers on that, but in many, many other metrics and ecosystem participants who are saying, we cannot afford another major meltdown. We need to have an orderly way to move from the old world to this, uh, the, this other world. And, and so we're seeing that take place right in front of us. So look, I, the way I think, see it very broadly described, it's more complicated than this, of course, but there are three types of stable coins. Yep. Fully collateralized, over collateralized, and algorithmic. Mm -hmm. I think of, Jeremy can correct me, I think of USDC as a fully collateralized stable coin. All of these stable coins have liabilities in the form of the what they owe the person who, who gives them the who who comes to them to transact uh, in Jeremy's case in the stablecoin case if your live if your assets then are uh, hundred percent treasury securities cash or right. something that's fully secure that looks like a money fund and that has I think a regulatory framework that feels a lot like money funds reg disclosure and regulatory framework that feels more like a money funds framework there's another set of stable coins that are over collateralized where people are bringing uh, digital assets that they hypothecate, borrow money against, and then invest, which looks like a Wall Street loan book. It's exactly what it is. And that happens. Margin lending. I mean, that, that happens yeah. every day and has happened for hundreds of years. By the way, just because they're wearing skinny jeans and all birds doesn't mean they're not doing the same thing that happened over several hundred years on Wall Street. <laughs> right? They're, they're dressing differently, and you know, they have avocado toast, not guacamole, but it's the same thing, right? <laughs> Um, and so uh, that's the, like a Wall Street loan book with an over collateralized um, uh, you know, set of uh, ha assets and that needs to be managed the way they manage margin loans on Wall Street. I've done it forever. Every financial market since going back to the Egyptians has done that. Uh, and then you've got this algorithmic stuff which I looked at, never understood how it worked, wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. That's what Terra was. It never had any assets to back its liabilities and was, in my view, um, pro prone to collapse, which it did. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a very different kind of stable coin than a 100% collateralized stable coin or an over, percent over collateralized stable coin. And you shouldn't confuse the two. The yeah, three. We, we just think about how do you take you know, government debt money, which is short-term government debt and cash, ideally at the Fed in, in, over the long run, and make that a digital currency. And that's what we're ultimately trying to do, and, and that is a very specific value proposition, which we think is very useful in the world. Do you find it strange that in DC policymakers, as well as regulators, focus their attention on collateralized backed stable coins, but not really much on algorithmic stable coins, which were really the one that caused retail investors yeah. to lose a lot of money this cycle? Well, I, I think a lot of the fo that focus in particular has come from the lessons of the breaking of the buck and 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 you know kind of prime funds and other things uh, where you know the Fed had to step in and backstop the entire uh, money market fund industry after the financial crisis and I think they don't want a repeat of that and I think the attention and as a result the attention is on the things that look like or have attributes that might behave like that where the underlying assets touch the real financial system and thus could impact flows in the real financial system whereas something algorithmic. At, at some level, like sell-off in crypto asset prices might cause sell-off in other asset prices, but that's a different, that's like market risk. It's different than financial stability risk in the, in the truest of, and financial core, you know, dollar liquidity risk or things like that. So I think it's, it's just a, that's the problem space by which they came at this initially. 
So the argument behind um, algorithmic stablecoins was that it was a decentralized coin that could operate in the DeFi space, unlike CeFi, centralized, um, collateralized back stable coins. And I wonder what your thoughts are on should there, like the existence of decentralized stable coins, would, is that something you would ever be interested in or something that the space needs? I, I mean, look, I think over the long run, various, uh, various models um, for price stable units of account um, that are not based on government debt are interesting. I think those, those are worthy of pursuit um, because it's not clear to me that uh, you know, government debt money, in, you know, certainly in many jurisdictions, government debt money is awful. Uh, and and you know, I think the US dollar government debt money is pretty good, uh, but you can imagine a world where it's not. And so the idea of stable units of account that are not based on government debt is worth pursuing. Um, I think right now, in literally today, and probably for the next 10 years, um, you know, a, a, a you know, reserve currencies that are well established in trade and commerce and the financial system, if you can uh, make those work with the kind of superpowers of, of cryptocurrency uh, and programmable and all these other things, it's extremely powerful and, and worthwhile. But to, to make those work and for people to really trust them, they will actually need that underlying liquidity and, and regulatory certainty, um, I, I believe, for, for mainstream scale adoption. To use the words algorithmic and stable coin together is an oxymoron. <laughs> right? Because if you look at the assets and liabilities of the balance sheet of the algorithmic stable coins, there's no assets to support the liabilities. It's not a stable coin. It's not. It's a something coin. else. Mm -hmm. uh, and it kind of forms of synthetic yeah. derivatives. Uh, yeah. Sense. Yeah. But yeah, it's more like a derivative. It's more like a, uh, it's. Um, it's a mathematical formula that tries to balance assets and liabilities inside a certain kind of environment, but that's not a stable coin. It's the wrong term to use for what that was. Right. You should, you should coin the, the new term for it, Glenn. Uh, it's, <laughs> we don't call USDC a stable coin. I mean, people call that, okay. call us that. We've never done that, unfortunately. I mean, not, not entirely true, but we, we, we call it a dollar digital currency, okay. and that's what it is meant to be. Um, so, you know, I, I think that word obviously came from, you know, you want something that's not volatile like Bitcoin, so you want something that is price stable. So yeah. it is what it is uh, in terms of naming. Glenn, I'm hoping that you can articulate, you know, since you've seen the early days of the financial service industry to where it is now, can you articulate the future of it uh, with the world of crypto involved and how that will look like, what will survive? Yeah, so I'm less, as I said, I'm less interested in financial services per se and more interested in how this new form of commerce. So if I see what, if the way I see the crypto solution working um, is you have environments where people gather together to do something of value to them. It can be something that looks like commerce. It can be something that looks like buying the US Constitution. Mm -hmm. And it can, that can be extended into, into any number of um, uh, charitable activities. So I was, Recently, for instance, on the border between Ukraine and Poland, doing a day of volunteering, welcoming refugees from Ukraine into Poland as part of my work for CARE. And the conversation at the border was, how can we set up a DAO to, to, um, to uh, accumulate talent and resources to help mount a relief effort? It's entirely conceivable that you could have a, a totally. crypto community that could do that. So the way to think about this is not, that there's a bank here, and now it's going to be a crypto thing. The thing about it is, there's a form of way in which people gathered to do commerce in the past that required a centralized hierarchy to offer, to, to offer guarantees to extract rents. The crypto solution, the problem of trust-free exchange, meant that we can actually gather communities together to transact in ways that don't require centralized hierarchies to, to add trust. And so we can organize commerce differently. Mm -hmm. Right? It's sort of like asking, like, um, when you, uh, Jeremy talked about the early emails versus emails today, is like uh, using, you don't, even though we use an envelope as a metaphor for the button you push when you send an email, it has nothing that looks like it's something that happened at the post office. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different thing. So the, the and, and remember, finance is simply a way to support commerce. Finance doesn't have an end in and of itself. It's a way to facilitate commerce. So if we have a different form of computing and a different mode of commerce, and the transactions that happen inside these networks that facilitate that are finance, 
then that takes away a fair amount of the purpose of the large financial institutions without substituting for them. Is that why you're invested in, in the metaverses? Because you see all these virtual worlds and the developing commerce on those platforms. Do you think they'll all survive? Oh, for sure. Look, if, if you look at a lot, a lot of enterprise technology today comes from consumer technology that's gone into the enterprise outside of the crypto world, right? And so the metaverse is one of the first places in which we see the kinds of activities that can be extended into mm -hmm. um, uh, more enterprise-related or uh, um, uh, corporate, commercially uh, yep. based kind of activity. We just need the UX and uh, user experience to be there. And you're investing and in acquiring a infrastructure for service to help that along. Tell us a bit about your latest news. Yeah, absolutely. This morning we announced uh, uh, the acquisition of Saibabo, which is a really breakthrough technology company um, that builds um, kind of crypto infrastructure as a service. Um, it's, a, it's an infrastructure that deals with security, custody, operations, NFT minting and custody, interaction with protocols, DeFi protocols, other things. And it's really, for, for us, it's, it's technology that's going to really advance our own infrastructure and, and what we can provide for as, as, as services and financial services uh, for our customers. But it's also a new product pillar for us, which is we want to enable developers and enterprises that want to build crypto apps and Web3 apps to have everything that they need to be able to do that and really help drive growth in these new, uh, you know, what we think of as crypto apps, which are going to drive the next generation of not just financial services, but games, content, and other categories. And so it's a major new platform infrastructure for us. We're really excited about it. Um, yeah. And um, we'll have, uh, you know, a, a lot more to say about um, new products that come out of that. Congratulations. All right. We have the final two minutes, and I guess my final questions are for Glenn. And that is, I heard that you had made a sizable donation to Harvard for their African American Center, and so now it's called the Hutchins Center. Right. So I, I'm interested why you're, about your interest in African American studies and perhaps its role in crypto in the terms of making the industry more diverse. That's an interesting question. Um, the, uh, we did a global search for a name and came up with the Hutchins Center. Um, <laughs> Uh, but look, I think um, uh, what, as a, what our philanthropy is largely focused on solving uh, some of um, the world's most important problems that we think are important to us, and we think the problem of race in America uh, is um, extraordinarily important. Um, you saw what happened in the Black Lives Matter movement, during, for instance, during the uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, the, we formed a partnership with Henry Louis Gates, Skip. Uh, one of the great um, uh, African-American scholars of all time. Uh, and we're going at trying to create understanding and build bridges. In a very similar way, these, uh, the correct, app, the appropriate application of the sort of technology that Jeremy talked about can create inclusion in communities that have historically not had banks, been charged very high prices for uh, credit, payday loans, remittances, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And so financial inclusion and fairness and transparency can be seen as a very important part of creating broader social justice and fairness across our economy. Mm -hmm. You are also serving on the Obama Foundation. In fact, you have a call with them right after this. So I'm just curious, does President Bar former President Barack Obama have any thoughts on crypto? As I said, if, if, if he would like you to hear his thoughts on crypto, he would tell you himself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting to hear it. All right. Thank you so much, Glenn. Thank you so much, Thank you. Jeremy, Thank there, you. for this. Congratulations on the acquisition. Thank you. Thank you. All right.